Welcome to One Bill's Light, the podcast that is the express version of our Monday to Friday program, One Bill's Live, brought to you by Collida Health. Instead of three hours, you get 30 to 40 minutes of the best Steve and I have to offer with fresh content along with our best interview of the week. Let's roll. Steve Tasker, who has been all over the field. Kind of unique. He was kind of a dual role player for you. Steve. A balloon. Steve. A blimp. <laughs> We're not even in the stratosphere of normalcy. Thank you for joining us here on One Bill's Life. Chris Brown, Steve Tasker with you, where we'll be discussing a handful of topics, including whether Josh Allen will finish 2020 with the most prolific season in team history for a quarterback. We'll ask Chargers GM Tom Telesco what convinced him to draft Justin Herbert sixth overall this past spring. And is there a more hated athlete in Buffalo, Steve, than Brett Hull? We will discuss. So, Steve, we know that Josh Allen, for the second time this season, was named AFC Offensive Player of the Week after his second 400-yard passing performance of the year. That came against Seattle, obviously. Taking a look at some of his current numbers, Steve, they're eye-opening. And I realize it's only 10 games played, but if the season ended today, he would have the highest single-season completion percentage in Bill's history at 68.4%. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's light years of where even the most optimistic fans of Josh would have put him this year. Everybody thought he would make a jump from, it was 58, almost 59% yeah. last year. Uh, people wanted him to get to 63%, 64 Now he's – I would have been happy with that. Yeah, and there's been a couple of weeks where he's touched on 70. Uh, and I think his best of the year was on 80, 86. An 86. Against so, Seattle. Right, so – Or 81.6, sorry. He has, he has taken it to a level that even Bills fans didn't even hope or even be optimistic that he could reach. So um, I'm going to say, he, yeah, I, I think he can probably do that. I, th I that think That is he the will. question. I think he can. And – this is a team that is playing better now than it has than it was, uh, and more consistently. I think they're even more dependable. And when the chips are down, and when and when the games are tighter, as we saw in Arizona, Josh has risen to the occasion. Uh, in the LA game early in the year, where they dropped a 25 point lead, they came back and snatched victory out of the jaws of defeat with a late drive. That speaks well for where they can go in tough situations during games. And coming down to the last part of the season. They're going to be a lot of tough games. He already has 364 pass attempts on the season, which is close to that of some of the other Bills quarterbacks in team history who have put together high completion percentage seasons for an entire 16-game schedule. Right. So we know NFL teams throw a lot more now, obviously. But So Steve is of the opinion that Josh, at the end of the year, can set the record for highest yeah. single-season completion percentage. What, do you think Even he stays around 68? Yeah. I will tell you, he's got to be over 65 and a half. That is the current record. Right. Yeah, I think so. I, I think he'll, he'll – yeah. I don't know if he'll stay at 68, but I see him beating 65 and a half. Yeah, I, I do think too. he'll do that quite easily. So, I do too. it's only fair, Steve, to begin our numbers game with the following question. Using 300 pass attempts as the qualifying number to be on this list, who are the four other – Bills quarterbacks in the top five all-time single-season completion percentage behind Josh Allen's current 68.4% completion rate. All right, here we go. And I'm going to guess. Four uh, quarterbacks. Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp is not on this list. Really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Joe Ferguson. Again, no. Not on this list. Kelly? Jim Kelly is on the list. He is... Currently third all-time, 64.1%, 474 pass attempts in 1991. And Rob I will Johnson. tell you, oh, no one else has appeared on this list more than once. Rob Johnson. It is not Rob Johnson. He is not on this list. And I think the reason why is he is under the 300 right. pass attempt threshold. What about Bledsoe? Bledsoe not on the list. Golly. Trent Edwards. Trent Edwards is the record holder. 65.5%, so. 374 pass attempts in 2008. All right, so I've got... So you've got the number one and the number three guy. So you need the number two guy and the number four guy so on the list Jim, right now. Josh will be ahead of all, 
all of four of these guys if he so leaves. So Josh, the then Trent Edwards, then number four is Jim. Jim. So there's somebody that's number three and somebody that's number five. Uh, 300 attempts in a season. Over 300 attempts. That's Flutie. The, it is not Doug Flutie. Ah. I'll give you a hint. Go more recent. Oh. Oh, Tyrod. Tyrod Taylor is fifth. 63.7% completion That's rate. 380 pass attempts Fitz? in 2015. It is not Ryan Fitzpatrick. No, that is a good guess. This guy is a little hard to remember because he was not here very long. But he was over 300 pass attempts. In fact, he had 447 pass attempts. Really? Yes. Oh, over two years or just over the No, nope. this is single season. You're kidding. No. Who had four? EJ. It is not EJ I Manuel. I figured it wasn't EJ. I was kind of throwing that out there. So. Uh, <laughs> One to go. Come on, you can get this guy. You might you might be angry if you don't get this guy. but I'm probably, yeah. Because you'll but, say, oh, that makes sense after you hear his name. Yeah, okay. I'm trying to go. I'm just going down to who's taking snaps. Uh, and I know there's somebody I'm missing in recent history. Is it recent? It's a recent guy. Like it's yeah. recent. Yeah, it's in the last six seasons. Wow. So who was here right before Tyrod? It's like Fitz, wasn't it? Well, there are a couple of guys in between there. You already guessed one incorrectly, it's not which Cobb. was EJ. It's not Cobb. It's not he Kevin. Not but you're right in that window. He's right in there. Twenty fourteen. I have no idea who it is. Who is it? It's Kyle Orton. Oh, Kyle never, Orton, would who played him. here for one year I would never have and then Kyle very Orton. unceremoniously retired yeah. after the season. I'm glad I didn't get it. Sixty four point two percent completion. I'm glad rate. I didn't so those get are your, Kyle Orton. Those are your top five. I actually feel good now, about myself that I didn't well, get it. Well, okay. But good on I you. I feel better that. getting that wrong Josh. than getting it right. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Allen, Steve, would also have the highest single season passer rating for a Bills quarterback in team history if the season ended today with a mark of 103.2. Do you yeah. think he can stay in the 102 to 107 range come the end of the season? Yeah, I do. I think, he, yeah, this is, it's for real. This passing offense is for real. The atmosphere of the league has changed to the point where this is going to happen more and more often. So I say yes. I think this is, okay. this change and this level of offense is who they are. So with that in mind, there are only two quarterbacks in team history, Steve, who currently occupy the top five single season passer rating years Okay. in Bill's history. So, so you only have two guys. One of them holds three of the five top spots. The other quarterback holds the remaining two. I'm going. Can you name those two I'm quarterbacks? I'm going the two obvious ones, Joe Ferguson, Jim Kelly. Jim Kelly is correct for holding two of the five spots. Okay. So he, holds, three. he holds the number one passer rating, 1990 passer rating of 101.2. And he holds the third spot in 91. 97.6 passer rating. the other guy rating. holds three others. The other guy holds the remaining three. The second best, the fourth best, and the fifth best, and it is not Joe Ferguson. Jack Kemp. Man, they are quick on the buzzer with Jack you Kemp. in there. It is not Jack Kemp. I'm ah! sorry. Come on, Jack. High passer rating. For three years. And yes, for three different seasons. Not Jack Kemp. And not they Joe were. Ferguson. It's not Joe Ferguson or Jack Kemp. No, and they were all in succession these three seasons, three consecutive years to rank second, fourth, and fifth in Bills history single season passer rating. Bledsoe. Not Drew Bledsoe. Was he here for three years? He was. O two, o three, o four. So that was a good guess, but uh, no, not not at the top. You want to know why Drew wasn't at the top? He took a lot of sacks. Yeah. And that hurts your passer. Oh, well, that's what Rob Johnson did, too. Yeah. Was it Rob Johnson? He he's, wasn't here for three. He's not Rob Johnson. I don't know if he played three straight yeah, seasons I know. enough of the time. Right. He was He was in the, he was in the training room more yeah. than he was on the field. Uh, God, three seasons in succession. Yeah. That, I was trying to help you with that, but I don't know that I'm helping you all that much. Fitz? It is not Fitz, but that's a good guess. I'll give you two more guesses and then I'll let you off the hook. 
or one more three game. Three in a row. Three, three, three consecutive seasons. Consecutive and it, ended, it ends up being second highest single season passer rating year in team history for a quarterback, fourth and fifth. Guy's got three of the top five right now. Now, Josh. How long was Flutie here? Flutie was here long enough, but he is not the correct answer either. <laughs> I, didn't ask, I didn't guess Flutie. I asked how long he was okay. here. Yeah, he was here that long enough count. to have three seasons. He was here till 01. Yeah. yeah, he was gone in 01. Let's 01. see. It's not Rob. It's not Rob Johnson. It's not. Who else was here? I do not know. It's a conservative quarterback. Tyrod? Tyrod. Tyrod Taylor, 2015, 99.4 passer rating. 2016, 89.7 passer rating. 2017, 89.2 passer rating. Yeah. How bad is it, Steve, that 89 makes the top five for passer rating for Bills quarterbacks all time? Isn't that that's it's, disappointing? It's hard, too, because, you know, you get into these where it wasn't a throwing league and you go out here in a t snowstorm or it's 20 degrees and sideways rain. And the older quarterbacks threw a lot more picks than we see now. And that crushes your Yeah, that crushes your pass rate. Yeah. So you get it. Work. All right, the last single season quarterback stat in Bill's history we're going to look at, Steve, is touchdown right. to interception ratio. Right now, Allen has the third best touchdown to interception ratio at 3-1. to one. Right. So there are four Bill's quarterbacks in the current top five for single season touchdown to interception ratio, who do you think they are? Tyrod. Tyrod is one. He's got three yes. of the top five. He doesn't throw picks. Yes. Three touchdowns to zero rating. Okay. Um, Tyrod, Jim. Jim, yes. One more. This guy's actually tied with Jim. So Jim did in 1990, 2.67 to one ratio. Who this guy? What what year was this guy? Well, if I give you the year, you'll know. Oh. But this guy tied him at 2.67 to one touchdown to interception ratio. Rob, not Rob. You got a lot of faith in Rob. Well, you know he he got a contract for you know. Yeah. So you figure he had a flash of something. Stay on the field. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> And it, it ain't Fitz, I know that. Not Fitz, definitely not Fitz. Um, yeah, Orton. Not Kyle Orton. You guessed this guy already today on the Bledsoe. Not Bledsoe. <laughs> I've guessed him already. Yeah, he's one of the guys you guessed. EJ. In one of these categories. No, it's not EJ. I'll give it to you. It is Doug Flutie. Oh, really? 2000, season 2000, 2.67 to 1. So, okay. Josh currently... Uh, actually, I, I have to correct my figures. I didn't update them from the last game. Josh is 2.22 to 1 touchdown to interception ratio right now. Um, do you think he can get to 3.5 to 1 by the end of the season? Because that's Tyrod's figure at the top of this list. 2017, 3.5 to 1 touchdown to interception ratio. Uh, he was there for a while. He was. He was way above it. And then this last game against Arizona brought him back under one. three to one. I'm going to take a quick look at the schedule going forward. We got the Chargers, Niners, Niners Steelers, Steelers, Broncos, Pats. Patriots. I'm going to say no. No, doesn't get there. Okay, yeah, I'm, I think that's a little bit of a hill to climb. Yeah, I think you'd have to go. You'd have to. All you need is one bad game, and it drops yeah, he's, you precipitously. Right. He's had a stretch like last year. He's gone through stretches where he's like 12 to two. You know. Yeah. Um, he would need to go on a tear like two. that again yeah, exactly. to get there. Because he was 16 no. touchdowns, four picks. He was 4-1 to one at one yeah, point this year. I mean, he was ripping it. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. So. yeah I, I think it'll be tough. That's probably the toughest one yeah, to come out of this season with. I think he gets passer rating. I think he gets um, the other one that we did, which was completion percentage. Right. I think he gets those. I think that's because he's got to. He can hang on and play like like those. This one, he's got to dig out of a little bit of a hole. Yeah, I don't think he can, I don't think that's something you can count on. All right, that is our latest edition of the numbers game. Time now for our guest this week. It's the general manager of the Los Angeles Chargers, Tom Telesco. We talk with the personnel boss of the Chargers about him being a Hamburg, New York native, his new franchise quarterback, and on the transition to their new stadium. Chargers GM. Tom Telesco, a uh, Hamburg, New York native, as many people know. Tom, first of all, how is the family and everybody getting through this uh, pandemic right now? Everybody good? I appreciate it. Yeah, um, yeah, the family's doing well. Um, you know, our kids are in school, not, not all week, but they're at least are in school right now. And, you know, we're just trying to handle it like everybody 
everybody else right now. How has the adjustment and the protocols for the NFL, uh, you know, affected you guys? I know you guys are in a, a, a new facility, I guess. I mean, you're not in you're not in San Diego anymore. You're just trying to get your you know feet in the door of the new stadium and all of this. And now they got this dropped on you. How has that adjustment affected you guys' ability to get on the field and play? Yeah, I mean, it's affected everybody in the league, um, but it, it's been a huge challenge. I mean, it's every day. Um, to try and follow the protocols and in the middle of that, trying to get ready for an NFL game. Um, but, uh, yeah, between the, the testing and, uh, and trying to keep people physically distant, you know, with, between you know, our players and coaches, they're together all day long. So um, at this point, we're all virtual meetings to get people out of the building, keep people separated. Um, it's a different way to prepare for a football game. But at this point, you know, we're all in the same, same protocol, same rules, but we're trying to keep everybody safe, keep us safe, keep the coaches and players safe and still be able to do our jobs. And, you know, I, I'd say on, on average, you know, the league's done pretty well. We know the numbers are going up across the country. I think our numbers are going to probably going to go up just based on society, but we're trying to do the best we can. And Tom, I mean, I'm, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, but Tom Pelissero from NFL Network was just reporting about some of the alterations Coach uh, Lynn is making this week with respect to special teams duties. Um, just your thoughts about maybe – going forward now and trying to make the special teams unit a better one. Yeah, we're, we're just trying, you know, we've been struggling in that, that, uh, that phase of the game for, for a number of weeks. So I'm um, just trying to look for ways to get better. Um, so we, we made some changes there and um, you know, it's, it's been an uphill climb for us as a football team this year, as you can, as you can tell by the record of three and seven. So um, just trying to do what we can do to get better right now. Well, we've watched with the whole country in amazement as on the spur of the moment when it began, Justin Herbert took over for Tyrod, <laughs> yeah. and we thought, man, it is a, it's going to be catastrophic. I mean, this guy's going to get chewed up and spit out. It didn't happen. Justin Herbert has been sensational. What? How – was it luck? Was it – what would you see in Justin Herbert? Because there were three guys, maybe four, ahead of him in the draft, you know, the process, and people thought, eh, I don't know if he's the right guy, if he's going to do it. What's he like? O Oregon, what's he – what did you see in Justin Herbert? How did he become a Charger? And, you know, how fast did you know he was going to be this good? Well, yeah, we, we were lucky in this year's draft because it was a heavy quarterback draft with a lot of talented players. Um, but, no, like he's, as you said, he stepped in against Kansas City without, I mean, literally seconds before kickoff um, and stepped in and, and really has just taken off from there. And, you know, he has a lot of physical ability. I mean, he's big, he's athletic, he's strong. Um, and then as a quarterback, he's got a big arm. You know, it's, I wouldn't say it's, it's not Josh Allen strong, but it's, it's pretty darn strong. Um, he's been accurate with the football. His, antici his anticipation skills and ball placement has been really, really good. And, you know, it's been a good combination. of It's a talented player. He's got great intangibles and work ethic and a drive to be great. And, and then, you know, and then this coaching, you know, coaching and player development between Anthony Lynn and, and Shane Slake and our offensive coordinator and Pep Hamilton, our quarterback coach, just trying to get him up to speed and get him ready to go. And it's, so it's been a group effort, um, but he's been impressive. He's kept us in games and uh, couldn't be more happy about him right now. Yeah, and, and I wanted to ask you, Tom, about Shane Steich and the offensive coordinator. I mean, he was given that role permanently, you know, this year after he inherited it halfway through the season last year. What was so convincing about the job he did last year and then how has he kind of worked with the, the rookie quarterback this season? Because, I mean, it's – I mean, the numbers are through the roof. Yeah, you know, he's very adaptable and flexible, and you have to work to what your personnel has or what, what, you, what, you, have, what you have in your personnel. And that, that changes on a week-to-week -week basis just based on injuries. And even this year, it's based on COVID. You're not always sure who you're going to have week-to-week. So um, he's a good offensive mind, comes from a very good background. He came up the right way. And, um, you know, he showed that last year. We had a lot of confidence in him last year, but when he took over the job, he showed it to us. And um, if that's continued on this year and, you know, we put him in a difficult situation. It's a rookie quarterback with no offseason program, no preseason games. And, and the thought that, that Tyrod Taylor would be our quarterback to start the year, obviously that changed in week, uh, week two. Um, but Justin has taken the job and run with it, and it's been a good combination for everybody involved. And as always, it's not all about COVID when you, when you get, you got an injury to Austin Eckler and it looks like he's been, and I, I can only imagine how bad his hammy was to be out 
uh, for so long. But getting him back on the field, certainly he may not be, uh, there may be a little rust on him, but getting him back on the field has got to give you guys a little bit, at least of an emotional boost, if not a, a pretty good boost in production as well. Yeah, I mean, he'll, he'll start uh, some practice this week. You know, I don't know what it means for, for you know, game-wise coming up. But uh, like I said, it was, it was a different type of hamstring. It wasn't your typical uh, sprinting downfield and strain your hamstring. It was, it was more serious than that. But you know, he brings a dynamic to our offense that you just can't duplicate because every time he touches the ball, he can take it the distance for a touchdown. He's so explosive um, both as a runner and as a receiver out of the backfield. It gives us speed and juice in our run game. Um, so, yeah, so he'll be a huge – um, a boost when he does come back. I'm not sure when that will be, um, but yeah, it's hard to duplicate guys with that type of skill. Um, he's done a great job to kind of work his way back from this. We'll kind of see where it goes. I want to I want to hit the rewind button a little bit and just go back to draft weekend if we can, Tom, because um, I found the draft approach for your entire division pretty fascinating. Like the Broncos and the Raiders pretty much determined they needed to invest in speed and high-end receiving talent in what seemed like an effort to keep up with Kansas City. Um, even though you added a couple of receivers later in the draft, you, you know you had receiver talent on your roster already, you had other priorities, but what was your review looking back on how the rest of the division reacted to the success that the Chiefs had last year? Well, they're, they're the team to beat, obviously. They've won the division a number of years in a row, won the Super Bowl. So, you know, when you're building your football team you are looking how you match up with the other teams in your division um so you do look to build that way but you also remember that you know we need to build our team as well to make them match up with us so it's kind of a double-edged sword um but yeah our, our division is uh it's it's tough you know we got kansas city we got the la um not the uh, we got the oakland i keep calling them the oakland raiders that like people used to call <laughs> the san diego Chargers, but the las vegas raiders um and then denver's come along denver as you said is very fast on offense so difficult division um and, you know, as we build it, we try and look to see where we match up. Um, but like I said, it goes both ways with that. What has Anthony Lynn's message been to his team? I know that when you're sitting there losing a game, I, was, I went back today and watched the Denver game you guys had in Denver where you were lumping them up. And somehow, some way, they fight back and beat you with an extra point. Uh, what's Anthony Lynn? How have, has he done during this time when the team's playing so well and is not getting rewarded for it? Yeah, well, he's, he's a great leader. He's got a great presence about him. Um, he keeps him focused on the game at hand. And you know, we, we've had three three games this year we lost in the last play of the game. You know, it could be the difference between three and seven and six and four. You know, who knows? Um, but, um, you know, we've had some situations here in the past. I know Anthony's first year, we started off very slow. Um, it was our first year moving from San Diego. It was a difficult position to be in. And then he rallied, rallied this team back, and uh, we made a huge run. So... Um, but, you know, he just has some really unique leadership skills, which you have to have in the head coach's job, especially in situations like this where things have not gone as we had planned. Um, and the players respond to him. The players believe in him. Um, that's why we think that this last uh, six games, and we, we're going to take them one at a time, um, but we still, think we're, we're, we still think we can finish strong right now. Talking to Chargers GM Tom Telesco here. And, you know, Justin Herbert's state of readiness, Tom, for the NFL game is probably what has grabbed people the most by surprise in terms of his success, you know, for outside observers that aren't seeing him every day in practice like you are. I don't know that the Oregon offensive system really ever put his full athletic ability on display. So how did you guys kind of do your due diligence in confirming he was the kind of quarterback that, had the necessary mobility to kind of extend plays and make them off script when necessary, which seems like a required quality in the league these days for a quarterback. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt. Um, it's, it's like putting a puzzle together, and it's not just with quarterbacks. It's not just with Justin. With, it's with everybody you draft. So when we're looking at college players, we're trying to project them to the NFL level. Um, and, you know, with Justin, Obviously, four-year starter in college, so we had a lot of background, a lot of work to do on him just tape-wise. Um, you just try and put the pieces together. You, you, you may not see him um, do everything he'll do at this level, but if you see it once or twice, you know it's in there. And, uh, look, Oregon's offense, you know, they moved the football. They scored points. Uh, they won the Pac-12 championship. They won the Rose Bowl. Um, so what they were doing worked for them. Um, but as scouting the player, 
we're trying to look at everything we can tape wise. We, we watched him, you know, the, the Rose Bowl, they played him a little bit differently. Uh, he was at the Senior Bowl and uh, where you could see a little bit more. But, you know, we knew he was a good athlete. We knew he could fit the system that, that we want to run. Um, and then everything else is just about a lot of it about is just his work ethic. He's a perfectionist. He wants to be great. And usually those guys, they get better. They develop. Now, he's developed faster than, than maybe we had anticipated. Um, but those guys get better that, that have the football intelligence and the work ethic and the right coaching around them. We, we marveled, and we were ta- Steve and I were talking about it on the show this week, Tom, how much his numbers quite, quite literally mirror those of Josh. And, I mean, much has been made of Josh's progress here in year three with the Bills and, and the big step that he has taken. Justin's doing this as a rookie. His numbers are almost identical uh, to that of Josh Allen, and he's played one fewer game than Josh. So, I mean, we've got him on our screen for our MSG viewers right now. I mean, it's almost a carbon copy. Um, it's just, it's uncanny that Herbert is, Herbert's game is this advanced when it, it took Josh about three years to get there. Well, that, that's all great, but the, the biggest stat is the one at the bottom. So that, that's, well, right. that's the one that, that's the one we're working on. And, uh, you know, the quarterback is very important. He touches the ball every play, but it's about the team. And, uh, look, we're really, really happy with Justin, with how he's, how he's developed, um, you know, for a young player. Um, and, and just watching Josh, you know, watching them, watching you guys the last couple of weeks, um, he has just been outstanding watching him play. It's like watching Josh Allen in the pocket is like watching like the varsity versus the JV. As, as the pass rushes come around, I mean, just swatting him around, pushing him around. Um, he's so big and strong. I mean, he runs the ball like a running back, and then, you know, his arm strength is unbelievable, and he's got great touch on the ball. And, and uh, obviously the receivers the Bills have, are, are really good too, and they go deep with that group. So he's got a lot of talent around him, and uh, he has to be a tough challenge for us this week. One thing I've watched uh, Justin Herbert do is you know, your offensive line's had some injuries, and it doesn't seem like that has bothered him. His athleticism has helped him in that. You guys have had to shuffle your offensive line. Uh, can you speak to that about how you know you've how concerning is it to you going forward? If certainly you'd like everybody healthy. Uh, how has your depth been in the offensive line, and how impressed have you been with Herbert and his ability to like just overcome that on the offensive side? Yeah, you know, it was interesting during training camp. Um, you know, his first couple of weeks of training camp, he was really lighting up the defense. So we tried to make it a little bit more challenging for him, and, and he had a couple rough, rough practices. But the one thing he did in training camp, it didn't matter if there was five, six, seven, eight people coming at him. He stood in the pocket, never looked at the rush, and made throws downfield. But the one thing we didn't know is it's practice because and you can't hit the quarterback during practice. So can he do this in a live situation in an NFL game? We didn't have a preseason game to know that. So we didn't even know this till really against against Kansas City, essentially, is you know, can can he still be that same guy when you don't have essentially a red jersey on? And um, he just has a great feel in the pocket to kind of move, shuffle either left or right, maybe step up in the pocket, find an open throwing lane and make throws. And you know, a lot of that is just natural ability, and a lot of that's just practice and work at it um and he's showing the ability to do that we, we've got a couple more starters back in the offensive line last week so that's good to see and um but no he, he's been able to handle the rush and handle the amount of pressure and blitzes people have brought against us very well for a young player talking to chargers gm tom telesco and uh, two guys on the defensive side of the ball tom i want to get your thoughts on um the one guy that you traded up for in the first round ken murray jr who just looked like a fantastic run and hit type athlete just looking at his college tape going into the draft just his level of progress here in his rookie season and then uh, a guy that's kind of flashed here that's kind of flown under the radar Mike Davis the the corner uh, just the game that he has brought to the table this season it looks like he's made an awful lot of progress with his game yes Michael's come a long way Michael was an undrafted free agent uh, from, from BYU and he's just each year taking a bigger step and now he's, you know, he's a legitimate starting corner in this league. He's got long arms and he runs very well. And he's had a nice year for us. Um, and then uh, who was the other player you mentioned? Oh, Kenny Murray. Kenny, so yeah. yeah, yeah, Kenny, he's been, uh, like you say, he's a run and hit player and uh, very physical, big, fast. And, and, you know, we've kind of put him in a position where he's the quarterback of the defense, which is, uh, it's difficult on young players. I mean, right now we've got a, you know, rookie quarterback on one side and really a, you know, a rookie linebacker that's making all the calls on defense. Um, 
you know, and especially not having Derwin James out there has kind of changed some things, how, yeah. how we get lined up. And so he's been put in some tough positions, but he's handled it well. Um, and for, for how young he is, he's very mature, um, loves to play the game, great, great work ethic. And uh, I think we're going to see really big strides from him as we move forward this year and then for the rest of his career. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because what you're going through now is exactly what the Bills did in, uh, what was it, 2018. You know, they had a rookie quarterback and they had Tremaine Edmonds calling all the stuff on the defensive side of the ball at the linebacker position. And it's kind of funny because their body types are almost a little similar. Murray's kind of that long, lanky guy too, it seems. At least that's how he looks on TV. Yep, very very similar players. Probably probably Tremaine's a little bit taller, but but similar players um, and both young when they came out of college too. Right. Yeah. Last one that I've got for you, Tom, is playing in these largely empty stadiums. And in the new one that you guys are playing in, it's got to be cavernous. I mean, that, that is a huge facility. Um, we've talked to some of the players here about how it's different, and especially the defensive players, Tom, have said sometimes when we need that juice from the crowd on a third down or something, it's not there, and we have to manufacture it and get it from each other. Um, I'm wondering if your players have expressed some of those same things and what they've done to try to overcome it. Well, yes. I mean, it's a uh, it's an experience like like none none other. I mean, it, the first game, our opener against uh, the Bengals, and it was an away game, but it, it felt like a a scrimmage. You know, with, without anybody in the stands, you hear every whistle, you hear every pad that that hits. You hear interactions between coaches and players and players and coaches. And um, it's just a different, it's a different feel. So you do have to bring your own energy. Um, you know, there are some positives. I mean, you can get some coaching from the sideline and you can scream out to wherever you need to, to get them lined up in the correct, in the correct spot. But uh, it, it's different. It really is. And it's, it's, it's hard to get used to. Um, but uh, it's going to help us this weekend going to Buffalo to not have that crowd behind them. So for us, this is a big advantage this week to play the Bills in, in a silent stadium um, because there's, there's, you know, probably no harder place to play to go play in front of 80,000 Bills fans, and especially the way the Bills are playing right now. So uh, at least it makes it an even playing field for us. Last thing I go, just we just heard before we came on, I'm sure you knew it uh, probably before we did, that the Steelers and the Ravens game has been moved from Thanksgiving to Sunday. It's been the first game that's been adjusted for weeks, ever since back in the day when Tennessee had the outbreak early in the season, and they kind of put the lid on that. It's been a player here, a player there. Uh, how, uh, given where we were, like, say, four months ago, back in July, uh, June and July, when they you know, didn't know, yeah. how unbelievable is it that the league has been able to keep this on track and keep it rolling, knowing that they didn't do it in a bubble and – I just think it may be in the in the calendar of the sports, this may be one of the great accomplishments the NFL's ever done if they can indeed get to the Super Bowl and do it on schedule. Um, how how likely is it? I, I guess I'll ask you that, but also how impressive is it that they've even got this far? Well, I think you hit it on the head. I think it's impressive that we've been able to do this without being in a bubble. Um, it would be hard for the NFL to do this like the NBA um, and get it in a, in a real bubble. Uh, so to do it like this with the protocols, um, and, and look, they've, we've adjusted these protocols from August till now. I mean, I can't tell you how many memos. I have a stack over here that almost a new one comes out every Monday as far as changing up um, how we're going to handle this, which we have to because we're learning more and more about the virus, you know, the, the longer we get into this. So um, it's been incredible to get to where we are now, but this is going to be the most difficult test right now. I mean, the, the numbers across the country are going up, so I think um, – Obviously, our numbers are going to increase a little bit, um, but you know, between us following the protocols, keeping away from each other, um, we wear these contact tracers. I know all the bills do as well to, to, to remind us of that. Um, our testing every day helps, and, and really, the biggest thing is make sure everybody's honest. If you feel anything, if you feel sick, you stay home. And uh, it, it's our job as as the front office to have the team ready to play. And it may be. And we saw last week or two weeks ago with Dane Jackson coming up and starting for the Bills. And actually, he played really, really well. Um, good player. So you have to build a deep team. You have to coach everybody. You have to be ready to go. So between the teams and the league office handling this, it's been impressive. But this this next uh, month and a half is going to be difficult. Um, but uh, hopefully we have things in place so we can get through and play these games and, and have a playoffs. Tom, 
Thanks, man. It's yeah. great seeing you. Good luck, and uh, thanks for coming on with us and taking a minute to, to share it with us. Yeah, anytime. Thanks for having yeah. me on, guys. We okay. appreciate the time, especially during a holiday week. And please thank your wife for uh, starting that jewelry company, Charming <laughs> Newport, because uh, I got three easy gimme birth uh, Christmas <laughs> gifts for my wife. She bought them for herself and handed them to me. So please thank your wife for doing that. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for the plug, Brownie. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, you Take got care. it, Tom. Happy Thanksgiving, guys. Yeah, to you, you too. too. Stay That's, safe. Uh, all right, always good to catch up with one of the solid GMs in the league, Tom Telesco. He's got a good roster. You were making some comparisons on the show this week, Steve, how strikingly comparable their numbers in a lot of areas are to that of the Bills, and yet their records are complete opposites of right. each other. But it's amazing. I think that's a Chargers team we're going to be hearing more from in 2021. Right now, we look at an offensive-defensive matchup called Something's Gotta Give. Okay, so Steve, the Chargers right. are the third-best passing offense in football. Bills are the fourth. L.A. has the most 50-plus yard plays in the league with six so far this season, demonstrating uh, Justin Herbert's deep ball passing ability. The Bills have no such plays, nothing over 50 yards, but they do lead the league in pass plays of 20 yards or more, 41 of them. So looking at these two defenses this week, Steve, Buffalo tied for fifth in most 50-plus yard plays given up in the league. They've given up three. Chargers defense has also given up three. So when giving up plays of 20 yards or more, Bills defense has given up the sixth most, 38. Chargers have given up the ninth most, 35. Which team ends this game making more big plays in the passing game? I will say I'd give it to Buffalo. You say they make more big plays in the passing game. I think this is okay. A, I think this is a, a game where they could make that happen, particularly given um, West Coast key team coming east for the second straight week. By the way, and, they were just with the Jets at MetLife. And I think week. this is a Bills team that's coming off the bye. I think they're going to have some wrinkles. Uh, yeah, so I would say I would give Buffalo the edge. And I, I, I just as a general rule going forward this week and. I just think I give Buffalo the edge in most categories leading up to the game because they're coming off the bye week. Yeah, I'm kind of with you on the bye. McDermott's undefeated coming off the bye. I think they really drilled down on some things, and I believe that Dable, with the extra time to prepare, will be ready I and too. locked and loaded. And, and Gus Bradley with this defense has, has had some issues at times. They get a little leaky here, a little leaky there. You don't know what's going to crop up. They can't protect leads with their defense. So yeah, yeah I'm I'm kind of with you on that. I'm one. Uh, so I'm I'm kind of leaning that way. That doesn't mean that I don't think the Chargers are going to be good. I think they are. I think they're a really good football team. And you you have to drill down pretty deep to find out. You know why are they three and seven and not seven and three like the Bills? Yeah. All right, we will move forward then after covering that as we wrap up this week's podcast here on One Bills Light with one burning question. I still got to get the guys to give me the echo effect. Yeah, on you need that. to do that. So this week's question, Steve, is there a more hated athlete in Buffalo than Brett Hull? For those that don't know, Brett Hull is the guy that scored the game-winning goal for the Dallas Stars in the 1999 Stanley Cup Finals against the Buffalo Sabres, did it here in Buffalo in Game 6 in triple overtime, and it was a controversial goal because his foot was in the crease, and there was a rule that said if your foot is in the crease and you score a goal, it does not count, but the refs allowed the goal, and a short time later, the Dallas Stars are skating around the ice in Buffalo with the Stanley that Cup. The, that ended the game on, a, on um, a goal that 153 times during the regular season would have been disallowed, but on the one goal where the cup is in the balance and is the prestige of the entire NHL in the balance – they sold out. Yeah, just give it to them. Just give uh, it, to them. it is otherwise known in Buffalo as no goal. And so because of that, Brett Hull, even as late as I want to say 2017, was in Buffalo and was booed unceremoniously uh, just for seeing his face on the Jumbotron in the arena. Yeah. <laughs> booed. Yeah. Uh, un now, you know. as far as being the ha most hated But is athlete? he the most hated athlete in Buffalo? That no. is the question here. You don't no. think so. So who tops him? Tom, I have some suggestions. Tom Brady tops yeah, it. that was one of the suggestions. And if you're talking about athletes, Tom Brady, I would say uh, at one point, maybe not so much now, Brian Cox Sr. Yeah. Uh, 
football-wise. Uh, let's see. Do you think Dan Marino is on that list anywhere? No, I think there's a level of respect for Dan Marino. Okay. Plus, he spent some time Plus, you guys beat him more than he beat you. So right. Uh, that let's helps. Say, <laughs> yeah, this is, yeah, it's interesting. Hold on a minute now, because this is you get into a... I would say probably... You know, there's some who probably never come to Buffalo, like mm-hmm. Troy Aikman. You think he's hated because of the Super Bowls? Yeah. Maybe. Do you think Michael Irvin's more hated than Troy Aikman? I think so. Just because of his Maybe swagger? Maybe Emmett. Uh, I think the Michael Irvin swagger is not... He asked for it, though. He well, he it. does. Yeah, he kind of, kind of plays to it. Yeah. So I, but I would say, yeah, Brett Hull is probably in the top five. Do you think Deshaun Watson gets on this list after last year's playoff game and what he did? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know if that's enough. That's not enough. It's just a wild card game. But usually, it's those guys that kill this that kill the Buffalo sports teams in the playoffs that are clearly the most hated. Yeah. Which is why it's so interesting that Brady would probably be at the top of this list. But I think that's just oh, the, it's just the, the time and again, you know, whack a mole, knock you down again Absolutely. and again and again and again. I think Brady does it. Deshaun Watson might make the list, but I, I don't think so because I think this is a, a time, uh, particularly now. Uh, that Brady's gone, and you know Desha- Deshaun Watson. You feel like you know this is a team now with what's going on in Houston. The Bills fans would say, "Shoot, I want another, I another crack at that guy." Right. Uh, I would agree with you that Brady is number one, and I will share a personal story. Two personal stories. The first one <laughs> involves my son, who is a died in the wool Bills fan. At age nine, he had a dartboard in the basement with Tom Brady's face on it. Okay, that that paints somewhat of a picture as to the hatred of Tom Brady. Here's example number two from my own household. We're watching the Monday night football highlights from this past week. Yeah. Bucks and uh, Rams. My wife did not see any part of the game. You know, she's watching her own shows on Monday night. She's not wasting right. her time with Monday night football. But I have the highlights on and she's watching them. She sees that Brady was playing last night, so she's watching them. First interception. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> I like it. Then we get down to the – she didn't know how the game ended. Right. You know, it's a close game. Oh, you know, you hear the commentator. Is it time for the Brady magic? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, but he's picked off again. Yes. Yes. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I mean, if that is not the true bitter vitriol of a Bills fan when it comes to hatred for Tom Brady. It's true. And My, that is a casual fan. Yeah. That is not a, you know what I mean, like an over-the-top I won't, I Gaga won't even, Bills fan. I won't even get into specifics or anything like that, but the, the conversations that in my house mm. with four sons, mm. who are now the oldest is 33, the youngest the 32, or the youngest is 22. He spent almost a lifetime with Brady. Dealing with this that it, the casual conversations <laughs> about Tom Brady and what they think casual of him, in quotations just in passing conversation you can't repeat <laughs> and I you know they're like it's everything and yeah. he is yeah so Brady I think trumps Brett Hull but Brett Hull is probably still there in the top three top five somewhere in there he's on the list no question yeah. uh, but it's getting further into history but th- th- here's the thing at a time and I didn't want to get into this at the time but Brett plays it up a little bit too he he like oh he doesn't care he'll flash the ring he'll talk about you don't know anything about hockey it was a good yeah. goal it was all this stuff and when it was a, it was an absolute blatant sellout thumbing of the cowardly nose. completely caving into the moment <laughs> event by the nhl yeah they totally they went garage league. Oh my gosh! It was it was cousin Vinny in the garage wearing a white tank top T shirt on a card table. It's over. It's running over. Running the league. That's where the that's where the edict came down from. It's over. Get the cup. It, that's right. Game's over. And now listen. And, and in <laughs> fairness to the Stars, the the Dallas Stars, they were probably the better team that year. But uh, my contention is this: they didn't get a chance to prove it. They just awarded them the cup. Yeah. So they can they can they can celebrate it all they want. They just didn't earn it. Well said. That'll do it for this week's edition of One Bill's Light, the microwave version of One Bill's Live. And remember, when there isn't enough time for One Bill's Live, there's always enough time for One Bill's Light. We're in and out in about the time it takes for you to drive to or from work. Steve Tasker, 
I'm Chris Brown. We'll catch you next week, everybody.